Burn down the malls from Mojo Nixon and Skid Roper. Mojo, a man who brought us the true spirit of Elvis, could pop your head like a big zit, brought Americana to the coast in college radio, and played the spirit of rock and roll on the big screen. He has his own holy trinity, host of several serious radio programs, and is now releasing a 10 CD and DVD set called The Mojo Manifesto, the original album. And there's a new documentary about him out. It's my pleasure to welcome to Revenge of the 80s Radio, Mojo Nixon. Welcome to the show, Mojo. Chris, I wish it was the 80s. I was a lot younger and better looking then. <laughs> I saw the pictures. I saw the videos. You look great, Mojo. <laughs> better than I, you me. You know, I am just shocked. That I am shocked that I am alive, and I'm sure many people are. And people are, people are even shocked. You made 10 records? That's that's a whole lot of mojo. <laughs> That's a heck of a lot of mojo. And and there are demos to boot in this box set, right? Oh, yeah. There's all kind of, you know, uh, the, all the good stuff has been scraped from the bottom of the barrel. It's all there. It's an, it's it's enough mojo. It, it, what it is, it's the essence of mojo. It's the mojosity. That's what it is. Yeah, I got that. As for the <laughs> demos, though, there's, it's always a... It's, they're always good to add a retrospective when you're pulling some of these uh, old tunes out and, and, and everything you've done. But there's something reassuring in the middle of worldwide turmoil to hear just you and one guitar doing Free Man in the Morning. Well, you know, part of it is uh, a lot of times I would I would demo the songs first like uh, into a boombox at the house, just me and acoustic guitar. And then I would go in, a, in just like a little, a little studio, maybe in San Diego or up in L.A., and we would do, uh, me and Skid would do a rough version of a song, you know, that, and then we would do, you know, do all that before we actually made the album. So, you know, we'd already made it, you know, two or three times. Yeah, that, that song, Free Man in the Morning, I was hoping that was going to be on the album Otis, but the, uh, uh, for some reason, it, it never, a lot of those same ideas that are in that song ended up in a song called Tie My Pecker to My Leg. That uh, you can't play for your grandma. No, no. Well, mine maybe, but... <laughs> <laughs> Mojo Nixon's with me on Revenge of the 80s Radio. The new box set, The Mojo Manifesto, the original album collection, is out. Ten albums filled with music, some shock value, and speaking the truth. A voice of the people, from those who want to be free to those who want barbecue sauce in their water slides. <laughs> yes, I am, I am... You know, I always saw my job... I saw myself as the court jester. You know, if, uh, if, you know, if in the eighties, there was a kind of a cow punk thing in Southern California, there was the beat farmers, there was the blasters, there was, uh, Los Lobos, there was Dwight Yoakam. There was a bunch of bands kind of playing hillbilly rock and roll, uh, loud and fast. You know, a lot of people had the same idea at the same time. I'm going to take what I like about the clash. And I'm going to combine it with Chuck Berry and Hank Williams. And, you know, I'm going to cause some trouble. So I always saw myself as the court jester of that group of bands you know, because, look, let, let's say I'm not the world's greatest singer, world's greatest songwriter, but I am completely and utterly full of it <laughs> and, and, and not afraid to spread it around. Mojo, you were, let's put it this way, your love of music and musical roots comes quite a bit from your dad's soul radio station when you were younger. Yeah, my dad ran a radio station in Danville, Virginia, where I grew up. It's right on the Virginia-North Carolina border. It's a small, you know, AM daytime station. And uh, WILA Soul Radio, the black spot on your dial. And when I was a kid growing up, you know, I heard James Brown and Aretha Franklin and Sam and Dave and all, you know, and Otis Redding. And I and I still love that, you know, music to this day. One of the great things about it was when my at the radio station, uh, for some reason, this was probably seventy to seventy three. Warner Brothers was sending all their records to the to the black radio station. So all, you know, the Randy Newman record, the uh, the Grateful Dead, all the artists that were on Warner Brothers back then, Van Morrison, were showing up at the station. And so the guy that was the music director, I, you know, I was like a teenager then. I said, hey, when those albums show up, just put them in a little pile over here to the side, and I'll come down once a month and get them. You know, <laughs> and so I had, like, promotion copies of all kind of, you know, great albums. And he's like... He, he was like, well, should I tell him to stop sending? I go, no, don't tell him to stop sending. I'm getting these for free. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the best kind of records, I'll tell you that. It was during a bicycle trip to, through the U.S. Now, listeners will learn this a lot more when they watch the Mojo Manifesto, the Life and Times of Mojo Nixon documentary. That's when you found your inner Mojo and uh, had the epiphany to let him out. You know, Mojo on the road to New Orleans. 
I, you know, I'd, already, I'd been in bands I, in 1982. Me and two other guys rode bicycles from San Diego to Danville, Virginia, where I grew up, coast to coast. Uh, took about two and a half months. We rode about 80 miles a day. Uh, people would let us sleep in their yard, or uh, we slept in the jail. We slept in the churchyard. We slept, you know, in the, in the county park. Once people found out we were on an adventure, at first they were wary of us. You know, who are these guys riding into town? Or, you know, once they realized we weren't homeless guys and we were going to leave, they, you know, people helped us a lot and we had a great time. <laughs> and it was, it was something I had always wanted to do. And, uh, and so, but in New Orleans, while in New Orleans is when I had the kind of the mojo revelation, which was I shouldn't try to be, you know, Mick Jagger or David Bowie. And uh, I should just be me. I should just play a little hillbilly boogie woogie and then start BSing over top of it. You know, I I should combine my love with for John Lee, my love of John Lee Hooker, with my love, with, you know, for Roger Miller and Jerry Reed, and I should just do what I do best instead of trying to be an English rock star. And it was so. And then when I got back from the bike trip, uh, I I played the first Mojo gigs, first you know, uh, and being you know turning going from Kirby McMillan to Mojo Nixon allowed me to do things I wouldn't have normally done. I'm I'm not Kirby McMillan pretending to be an old old black blues man. I'm Mojo Nixon from Bigfoot, Louisiana. Here we go. <laughs> Mojo, on that bike trip, I'm, I'm just guessing this now. I'm not sure if I'm I'm right here, but this is a guess from a guy sitting on the outside behind the microphone in the studio here, listening to your records for several years from the '80s onward. Knowing that you've been on this trip, it seems like you got to meet a lot of the people and and the festivals and and all, all the uh, the Americana that you wrote about in your music. Well, and I think, and I had always been, you know, I. I I was always a fan of Walt Whitman and this, this the big idea of America. So I would you know I didn't just see America as uh, I I saw America hopefully the same way Woody Guthrie did and like I said the same way Walt Whitman did and the same way you know and Bruce tries to do that Bruce Springsteen and I and I saw America the same way as a big wild wonderful place that could, you know uh, that we should all be excited to go to and. You know, right. And I and I saw, you know, I know America has plenty of bad things, but what I saw was the good stuff and the good stuff was everywhere. And, you know, and it made me feel good. When I hear when I when I hear Arthur Conley sing sweet soul music, I know I'm glad to be alive. I know that something good is happening on the planet. And I knew my I felt my job was just to try to if I could just create a little bit of that magic every now and then, you know, uh, I would be doing something good. Maybe with Elvis is everywhere. Right. If you're a big Elvis fan and there was all this crazy Elvis stuff going on and you heard Elvis everywhere and you smiled, you smiled on the way to work. And maybe the boss didn't seem to be such a jerk after all. Yeah. And the Elvis was trying to get out of you, too. That, that, that's important. <laughs> Got to have that Elvis. Well, Elvis out of you. Is in you, but yeah, he was trying to get out of Joan Rivers. Yeah. <laughs> How did Mojo Nixon, Mojo, Mojo Nixon, the character, you playing Mojo Nixon on stage, jumping around, doing your thing, get discovered and get that first record deal? Well, we had made, uh, me and Skid Roper started playing in San Diego. This is 83, 84. We're playing around town. We're also at the same time, we're in like three other bands. Those bands start fading away and we won some contest, some kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, battle of the bands in the, in the, we won the battle of the bands put on by the local radio station. You got three hours of studio time for winning the battle of the bands. And we won the battle of the bands. We recorded three songs, recorded, <laughs> overdubbed and mixed three songs in three hours. The guy thought, cause they gave you three hours thinking you'd buy three more. Oh no, man. We were broke back then. I was living on top ramen. I remember we were so broke. I used to go <laughs> sneak in the neighbor's yard to steal their cherry tomatoes. That was my oh, Friday. Man. That was special. If I could put cherry tomatoes on my top ramen on Friday night, woo-wee! <laughs> you need your veggies. So, it, yeah. But we, uh, we, so we made a little demo tape. And then later, I hooked up with Joey Harris. He was in the Beat Farmers. I went over to his house, and we recorded what became the first album, thinking it would just be demos. And uh, we're opening for this band, uh, Texan Horseheads in San Diego. And a lot of these kind of cow punks, roots rock, uh, Jason and the Scorchers, the Del Lords, the Del Fuegos, uh, a lot of those kind of uh, kind of bands were playing, and we would open for them, and we played with the Beat Farmers all the time. And uh, this, I, and I always had a cassette in my pocket, you know, in case 
you know, <laughs> in case David Geffen was walking in the door, I was ready. <laughs> Here you go. <laughs> and um, so anyway, I gave it to this guy who managed Texas and Horseheads. He gave it to my friend, Ron Gowdy, who just passed away recently. Ron calls me up and says, hey, man, let's, let's put this out. I go, no, that's just demos. He goes, oh, no, we put this out. You know, we'll make another out. We'll make another better album after this one. Yeah. And Ron Gowdy is the one. He signed me. He got me signed to Enigma Records. He's the one that produced Elvis is Everywhere. Uh, he, he, Ron Gowdy also did the Dead Milkman. That's why I mentioned in the Dead Milkman song, because it was a Thanksgiving dinner. Uh, <laughs> the Dead Milkman were on the road. They had nowhere to go for Thanksgiving. They came to my house in San Diego. And uh, that's how I got mentioned. Right. Being mentioned in Punk Rock Girl yes. uh, by the Dead Milkman was bigger than anything I ever did. Well, th these stories should have Mojo Nixon. That's right. Yes, yes. <laughs> but uh, so anyway, I got signed to Enigma Records. Enigma, you know, when you got bi big enough on Enigma, they moved you up to Capitol. It was all it was all part of Capitol and EMI. Even we went to England. We were in like the big EMI building. We took some pictures there on the stairwell where the Beatles took those pictures. You know, there's like those before and after. There's the 62 Beatles and then the 68 Beatles with standing on the, yeah. So we got to take, we were, you know, it was unbelievable. We got to uh, go up to Capitol Records up in LA, there in Hollywood and Vine. We uh, mixed our album up there. So yeah, I was, I was in the middle of it. I was there, man. <laughs> <laughs> With me is Mojo Nixon. We're talking about his new box set, The Mojo Manifesto. Let's talk more about that and the documentary, The Mojo Manifesto, The Life and Times of Mojo Nixon on Revenge of the 80s Radio. Destroy All Lawyers from Mojo Nixon's 1990 Otis album. With me is Mojo Nixon. He has a new career-spanning box set, The Mojo Manifesto. Mojo, you got a lot of MTV airplay with Elvis is Everywhere, but you tell the story in the track Stuff in Martha's Muffin about how they wouldn't play you in Skid Roper, even though you were college radio staples with your first albums. You know, and, uh, and after I did uh, Stuff in Martha's Muffin, uh, I did some promos for MTV. Mark Pellington, who later became a famous movie director, he was working there. Uh, he was working there at MTV doing the promos. Remember, they did like Randy, Randy of the Redwoods. Yes, yes. They had other kind of odd. Like MTV had this idea: if we get kind of oddball weirdos, we'll appear to be hipper than we are, even though you know we're playing uh, Journey videos. <laughs> so I. So then this was way. This was about the time the second or third album came out, and I, I made a list. I, they asked me if I wanted to do it. And I was like, no, if Mojo doesn't sell out. And then I thought, well, the only way, you know, the only way a teenage girl in Iowa is ever going to hear about me is through MTV. I should do that. I should figure out a way to do this. So I made a list of 20 demands. They agreed to all of them. <laughs> you know, I was thinking they would, you know, I could say, oh, the MTV wouldn't do what I said. But anyway, they agreed to all of them. I made these promos spots for MTV. And that was huge. It was, uh, that really got things going. That's around the same time Elvis is Everywhere came out. Before the MTV spots and before Elvis is everywhere, nothing but dudes at the Mojo Show. 30, 32 dudes in some small college town in upstate New York. That was your typical Mojo Show. And then we did Elvis is everywhere, and they started playing it on, they played Burn Down the Malls, and they played uh, Elvis is everywhere on 120 Minutes all the time. Uh, you know, girls started showing up at the show. Now, mostly they were designated drivers. Oh, yeah. Their boyfriends we go and, you know, get, get drunk out of their minds and the girls would drive them home. We have some gin guzzling, <laughs> right? Yes. Yeah, they had to, you know, I always used to say, you know, uh, the girls would agree to come if the, you know, if the guy would go see some Jody Foster movie. If the guy would agree to go to a Jody Foster, the, you know, the one where she doesn't talk. If, if a guy would agree to go to that movie, then she would agree to come see Mojo. Well, we have to show up at those drunk, I suppose. So, you know how that works. Well, yeah. I, we lots of times, man. We would have you know fans, super fans. We'd get too excited, too drunk, and they would be thrown out before we even played. And like we'd be coming in the back door, you know, uh, you know, to the dressing room, and they'd be like crying. Oh no, I got too much. Oh no, can't get me in. So, we were once. I can't remember the place, but we were opening for the Pogues. Uh, we were opening for the Pogues, and it was uh, I think the living room in uh, is in in New Haven, maybe, or somewhere. It was in Connecticut, Rhode Island. Anyway, 
some guy got thrown out. He climbed up a brick wall like Spider-Man, and there was like a, a window that had like one of those, you know, uh, tram things that opened, you know, slid up. Anyway, we're sitting backstage with the Pogue's manager, and this guy just comes oozing through the window like a cat burglar and falls 10 feet onto his head. And, and he, he jumps up and he goes, which way is the stage? And just runs out of the room. <laughs> <laughs> That was a real mojo fan there. <laughs> you came to my area with that Pogues tour, too. Uh, I live in the Hudson Valley and lived there back then, too. By the way, that tour inspired the track Shane's Dentist. I imagine that was one wild road trip with those guys. Oh, uh, it was, you know, we did two tours with the Pogues. The first time, it was just us and the Pogues uh, playing medium-sized joints. The second time, it was us, the Pogues, and the Violent Femmes playing, you know, huge outdoor shed. And uh, in fact, I was just on the Outlaw Country Cruise. That's a channel I'm on on Sirius XM, Channel 60, Hillbilly Rock and Roll. And uh, Cot, the original bass player for the Pogues, was on the cruise. I got her to sing Shane's Dennis with me. And Shane's <laughs> Dennis is, a, is, is, it goes, Shane's Dennis, Dennis don't, don't work, work too hard, hard always at the, at the pub. pub. Shane, Shane says he ain't coming down back to their down to a nub. That's it. It just repeats that over and over. <laughs> And I played it for I played it for Shane, and then he just he smiled, showed me his teeth, and that you know it, it, it was terrifying. <laughs> Mojo Nixon with me on Revenge of the 80s Radio. On to MTV. You were a casualty of MTV censorship with Debbie Gibson is pregnant with my two-headed love child, and you've always been kind of a, an activist when it came to music censorship. Well, and I, you know, I, I wrote that song, I Ain't Gonna Piss in No Jar, and I wrote Burn Down the Malls, and I Hate Banks and Destroy All Warriors. Uh, they got their own bar where, you know, you know, I, I'm forgetting the line. Like I, I, had, I had the line, now I forgot it. Uh, oh, they got their own bar where they drink pints of greed. <laughs> Let's spay and neuter them so they can't breathe. <laughs> so, right, I've always been a troublemaker. And in hindsight, right, MTV was never going to. Debbie Gibson's pregnant with two had a love child. It's essentially a Little Richard song. I stole a Little Richard. Uh, I stole the Credence version of a Little Richard song. It's really just Credence uh, traveling band, which is one of my favorite bands anyway. But uh, the idea, I'm making fun of Debbie Gibson. I'm making fun of Rick Ashley. I'm making fun of Tiffany. And, I'm, and here's where I really got in trouble, making fun of Spuds McKenzie. Right, that's how, that's how they made their money. All right, so in hindsight, now at the age of 62, I've got, well, yes, they were never going to play it. But <laughs> what was so frustrating then was, one, the song was good. It was short. It was funny. Uh, I'd moved, I'd gone to Memphis and Jim Dickinson produced it. I got a baritone sax solo in the middle of it, just like a little richer. You need one. And uh, I made a video with Winona Ryder playing Debbie Gibson. I said, this, this is going to be bigger than Jesus. Uh, not so much. <laughs> oh, look, MTV's a weird bird when it comes to censorship anyway. Heck, for a while, the station allowed rap songs to talk about beating up their girlfriends and couldn't let Mojo sing about tabloid rumors involving stars or even let Tom Petty say joint and uh, uh, you know how it feels. Yeah, now they... Uh, and, right, so I, I just wanted MTV to admit the fact that uh, they weren't going to play the video. And the part of it was, I had done, like I said, I had done all kind of I'd done the promos for MTV. I'd also done Spring Break. I'd done Super Bowl. I had done uh, Mardi Gras. And I'd done a bunch of, I did a bunch of uh, pilots, you know, where they were moving into TV shows. But part of the thing was the original VJs they had on MTV, they were very good at reading, you know, reading what was written on the cards. Uh, but at a live event, uh, you know, there was not, you, you couldn't write. They needed somebody who was adept at the art of extemporaneous pontification or BS. <laughs> you know? And so that's why I was good at the live of it. You need me to fill two minutes? There ain't going to be no problem. There you go. <laughs> yeah, right. So but anyway, so MTV, I thought because I'd done all these things for them that, you know, that I, and, and I, I got paid or a little bit, but it was, you know, I really did it thinking I'll do this for them. They'll play my video. Uh, not so much. In fact, uh, you know, six one nine two three nine King uh, from that same album got played. You know, got played a ton on VH1. Uh, 
Chris Christopherson is in the video. I showed it to my mom. She goes, that's not Chris Christopherson. Chris Christopherson is a big movie star. He's a, you know, having an affair with Barbara Streisand. He ain't going to be in your raggedy ass video. <laughs> but he was. <laughs> he was. <laughs> yep. They're going to eat them words, right? That's what I can. That's, that's all I can tell you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Mojo Nixon with me on Revenge of the 80s Radio. You also tackled in your in your music, in, in your way, the Mojo way, freedom issues, uh, legalization of marijuana. You even made appearances for Kinky Friedman when he ran for Texas governor. That guy's a smart guy. He used to listen to him on Imus every once in a while and a uh, very smart fellow. Well, and at some point, you know, uh, uh, me and Kinky, I, I had a movie deal. This, this, how bad, this is how bad things got. I had a movie deal. Hell, Paulie's. But, you know, Polly Shore made five movies, so I can get a movie deal, yeah, right? Have anyway, one uh, I had a movie deal, and I hired Kinky to uh, I had Kinky to write the screenplay. And let's just say, uh, you know, you know that bumper sticker, my other car went up my nose. Well, in, in our case, the, the movie screenplay went up our nose, but we became friends. And <laughs> you know, this is in the eighties. Kids today don't, don't don't do that. But we. Um, me and Kiki became friends, and Kiki, at one point, there was a four-way race in uh, Texas. Kiki had 27% in a four-way race. Well, in a four-way race, you can win with 27%. Yes, you, you know, can. Everything goes your way. So, and he, Kiki, had, I gone down there to interview him for Outlaw Country, and he said something like, you know, Mojo, when I get elected, I'm going to need good people like you to surround me. Maybe you could be my, you know... Maybe you could be my spokesman. I said, oh, you mean your minister of disinformation? Yeah. He goes, yeah, that sounds good. <laughs> the secretary of soul. There we go. Yes, I was going to I was going to go down there and uh, help. King. In fact, I booked, you know, uh, later things didn't turn out as well at the polls. But I was there election night because, you know, what if he won? If he won and I wasn't there. I wouldn't get to be Minister of Disinformation. Yeah, there we go. Mojo Nixon with me on Revenge of the 80s Radio. And perhaps the political world also followed you in other ways, Mojo. In the Otis album, one song was titled Put a Sex Machine in the White House. You listen to the lyrics. Makes sense. But what happens? <laughs> 1992, Bill Clinton gets elected. They listen to you, Mojo. You know, yeah. Uh, before, we, uh, before Bill Clinton, those guys weren't very sexy. No, no. Dan Quayle. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, uh, but you know, Bill. Uh, one of the things, one of the things that uh, you know, I was doing there was I just I was trying to do like a James Brown song, and uh, but you know I'm a hillbilly from Danville, Virginia, so it's kind of you know it's kind of idiot James Brown. But he makes you it makes you get funky. It makes you want to get on the good foot. Mojo, I bought the album orders. I was doing college radio at the time, and I'm listening to it. I didn't read the liner notes as of yet. I just stick it on the record player and start playing. I like it. I do it that way. I'm hearing familiar sounds. I hear Mojo, obviously, but I can hear, I guess, a style of bass that I recognize from listening to punk all these years, too. And I'm thinking, I better check this out. I read the liner notes, and I find out it was John Doe on bass. You can hear the John Doe bass, especially in Don Henley Must Die. And I find out you put this really, this, this excellent supergroup together for the Otis album. Well, you know, me and John Doe are in that movie, Great Balls of Fire. That's where I met one other writer. And so, you know, when you're in a movie, you're together, you know, you work six days a week, 12 hours a day. And then, you know, I know stuff about John Doe, Exine don't know. So I was <laughs> able to get him. <laughs> I was able to get yeah, I had John Doe playing bass, John Doe from X playing bass. I had Country Dick Montana from the Bee Farmers. I had just gotten done with uh, throat surgery. He's playing drums. I had... Uh, Bill Davis from Dash Rip Rock playing guitar, and I also had uh, Eric Roscoe Amble from the Del Lords playing guitar, and then Jim Dickinson producing, and he's probably playing keyboards on most everything, and Jim Spake, a uh, noted Memphis saxophone player, he's playing on most everything, too. And we recorded at Chips Moments Three Alarm Studio right off of Beale Street there in Memphis, and we had a huge budget. Uh, it was go that record was going to be huge. This, this is a lot, a lot of Mojo story. That record was going to be huge <laughs> till Enigma Records went out of business, not promoting Mojo, but David Cassidy. They spent their last million dollars on some David who David Cassidy comeback when they should have spent it on me. And in fact, we were going to make the song "I Want to Race Bigfoot Trucks," the original Bigfoot truck from St. Louis, Missouri. We were going to get. I was going to get to drive it. I was going to get to crush some And stuff. you didn't get to drive We were going to shoot a video. Hmm. You know, and 
it, and if you listen, you know, if, it, if you listen, I want to race Bigfoot trucks and destroy all lawyers. You say, maybe Mojo been listening to a little too much Bruce. <laughs> one, one of the things, one of the things that Skip Roper said that was true. He goes, uh, I, you know, I don't know about that. All I know is you wanted to be Bruce Springsteen. And yeah, I realized later, I want to race Bigfoot trucks is actually parts of three different Springsteen songs put together like Frankenstein. It's a Frankenstein Springsteen song. <laughs> As for the name of the album, Otis, that's part of your holy trinity, Elvis, Foghorn Leghorn, and Otis the Drunk. A good combo, perhaps symbols of true Americana, because nobody messes with Foghorn Leghorn either. He almost always outsmarts that dog. <laughs> You know, I always love Foghorn Leghorn is based on this uh, radio character, Senator Beauregard Claghorn. Yes, yes. And uh, I'm <laughs> I'm looking at the book, right? I'm looking at them. They made a movie called It's a Joke, Son. That's a joke, son. <laughs> Pay attention to me, boy. So I always, you know, the loud, uh, over-the-top uh, Southern character was something I always gravitated towards. In fact, had I not got into music, I could have possibly been a wrestling manager. You know, I could have been the new mouth of the South, or I could have been the late night TV car salesman. You know, I could have sold, you know, I could have sold Buicks at 4 (laughs) a.m. Yeah, buy my car or I'll eat a light bulb or something like that. There we go. (laughs) You know, there was a guy, Madman Dapper Dan. I'd give him away, but my wife won't let me. After that, you uh, put together the Toad Lickers and, and recorded one of the better Christmas albums, actually, over the years, too. And uh, there's a lot of the silly stuff, a lot of the great mojo stuff in there. But really, musically, excellent covers of Mr. Grinch and Boogie Woogie Santa Claus among the group. Well, you know, the Toad Lickers were a band uh, down in Austin, and their, their, uh, their guitar player quit. So I was able to, you know, just bring them in all whole. And I wanted to, uh, I'd wanted to form a band, you know, because me, part of the problem with me and Skid was it was just a duo, and two, I was sitting down. I wanted to stand up. Paul Westerberg was standing up. Los Lobos was standing up. Dwight Yoakam was standing up. Mojo was standing up, too. And um, so, yeah, and I, we, we, record, we recorded that out. That album, the Christmas album, when I hear it now, I get drunk and high just hearing it. That's, <laughs> that's how good it is. <laughs> Me too. I play it every year. I have to listen to it in the car every Christmas season. That and your Christmas Christmas song. Yeah, no, well, and that, that song, Christmas Christmas, was uh, at the time they wouldn't let us put it out because whoever owned the publishing, Richard Berry had sold the publishing to Louie Louie to somebody, whoever owned the publishing wouldn't let us do a parody. You know, now that rule has been relaxed. You know, but uh, yeah, Christmas, I, the, I, I had this bit, was one of my big ideas. Let's combine Christmas and Louis. People love Louis Louis. People love Christmas. How about we bring them together? <laughs> <laughs> Mojo Nixon's with me on Revenge of the 80s Radio. You were recording albums throughout the 90s, uh, post Toad Lickers as well. You put you had some classics out there. Are You Drinking With Me, Jesus, with the real Sock Ray Blue. You had uh, the Whereabouts Unknown album. So this 10-box set is going to span really pretty much everything. Yeah, it's everything. The only thing that's really not there is the uh, the I did we did a whole album with Jello Biafra, Prairie Home Invasion, uh, and that and that's where uh, Drinking with Me Jesus is from. And then the, there was me and Country Dick and Dave Alvin did a thing called the Pleasure Barons, and uh, so some of this stuff that was uh, that was either legal or financial reasons we couldn't get it all. But these are all the Mojo. This is all the Mojo albums plus two albums of outtakes and extra stuff, you know because. If anybody, if anybody said, "Hey, Mojo, you want to record a song for our our wacky idea?" Sure, <laughs> you know, <laughs> want me in, tell me what time to be there. <laughs> you know, we, we may, maybe we learned the song, maybe we didn't. You know, yeah, or maybe you pull something off that nobody else can pull off. Especially, you got that combo with a lot of the, with a, with a lot of varied musicians. Again, some of the top musicians in the world were doing work with Mojo Nixon. So when you when you said earlier in the interview, you you said you weren't the best singer or guitar player. Well, apparently, all these other great musicians are attracted to working with you. So it has to be something there, right? Well, yeah, you know, and th- this gets back to the uh, to the movie. You know, the movie. Uh, was supposed to show at South by Southwest, have a big premiere, and uh, and the, because of the virus, everything has been delayed. But I tell you what, uh, the movie shows, you know, the, the movie's it's about me, but what it's really about is rock and roll. It's about what you, what, you know, what you like about the spirit of rock and roll. 
if I am just carrying the tradition, like I said, of Bruce Springsteen and, and Woody Guthrie and Joe Strummer, if I'm just carrying that tradition a little further down the field, I'm happy. And hopefully uh, at some point in the future, you'll be able to see the movie. It'll be on Amazon and Netflix. And you'll go, oh, anyway, I remember that. Hey, wait, I was there. Hey, I vomited <laughs> at that show. <laughs> You can find the trailers on the Mojo Manifesto YouTube channel. They're easy to find. I'll put links to them on the website, too, revengeofthe80sradio.com. Movie spans your life from uh, young Mojling to today, I guess, right? Yeah, my bass player, he did all this. It's it's amazing. One, it's amazing how good he made me look. I know me. I'm not that good. And two, and two he's a bass player, and he made a movie. It's like finding out your neighbor's an astronaut, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and, and he made a movie, and it, I know the sound, you know, and it's really good. So I know I, you know, I like it. It's about me. But if it, even if it wasn't about me, you would still be shocked. Mojo's bass player made a movie from scratch, and it doesn't suck. This is unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> I do want to add, you did retire from recording and touring in the mid-2000s, save for some one-offs, but you're a DJ now on Sirius XM Radio, prominently with Outlaw Country. I'm not a fan of that crossover pop country. That's not real country. This is Outlaw Country, right? Yeah, no, this is, you know, inner tradition of Hank Williams and George Jones and Johnny Cash and Waylon and Willie. This is country with an attitude. This is Joe Ely. He's the perfect artist for the, you know, this is Steve Earle and Lucinda Williams. You know that uh, that picture of Johnny Cash giving the finger? That's what we are. It's right. It's, it, so some songs are too too rock and roll for country music, and some songs are too country for rock and roll music. We play them all. We play them all, and they a lot of times they have a very independent attitude. Tie, don't want the man telling them what to do. Right. This isn't suit country or or law abiding country. This is outlaw country. Right. And, you know, it's right. It's not safe, boring vacuuming, you know, Barbara Mandrell country. Some people complain, you know, that it's, it's that I go a little too far, but hey, that's my job. <laughs> yeah. If I don't make if I don't make some straight people uneasy, I ain't doing shit. Wait, they can't say that on the radio. <laughs> that's right. You'd be doing pop radio if you want to be boring and just read a card and go to the next song. That's not that's not real DJing. We only have a short amount of time, Mojo, and there's so much to cover. I want to thank you for coming on with me here on Revenge of the 80s Radio. Chris, thanks a lot, you know, for uh, for having me. And uh, you know, if you're if you're a Mojo holic, if you're a Mojo knight, the Mojo box set makes a perfect Christmas gift. Go ahead and give it to yourself now. And once again, the 10 CD DVD box set, The Mojo Manifesto, is available. Get it on Amazon. We have a link to it on our website, revengeofthe80sradio.com. Coming soon, be on the lookout for The Mojo Manifesto, The Life and Times of Mojo Nixon, the movie. Didn't premiere at South by Southwest because South by Southwest didn't happen. The pandemic. That's the only thing that could stop Mojo, the pandemic, I guess. Uh, <laughs> I didn't think it would. Well, I, we, try, we, tried, we tried our hardest to try to set something else up. But yes, we've been defeated by the virus, but we shall return. Like MacArthur, we shall return bigger, better, crazier than ever. Hey, Chris, thanks a lot for having me, man. Thank you, too. Let's play a track from the new box set and from the album Get Zooks, the homemade bootleg. Are you drinking with me, Jesus? <laughs> 